Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the first day of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'm Nicole Molinero, proud and very humbled to be the president and CEO of Women's Center and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh. And I am thrilled to welcome you to the first session of DV and series, a four part educational program exploring the intersection of domestic violence and topics like identity, family, money, and men. Today's presentation is a timely one. The murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the ensuing protests have brought to the fore the long-standing racial inequities and inadequate systems that riddle our systems in, systems that riddle our systems and institutions. In the wake of Floyd's murder, we realized a statement on racial solidarity in which we reaffirmed Women's Center's commitment to ending violence in the home and society at large, which is on our website. This universal commitment to our client's safety, no matter their race, age, gender identity, place of birth, or sexuality, is our guiding light through the penumbra of discrimination that so deeply impacts our lives. It is with this in mind that we choose identity as our first topic for the DV and series with the understanding that identity has many different intersections beyond race. I am pleased to introduce our three presenters for today. Rhonda, Director of Education and Outreach, Avi, our LGBTQ plus outreach advocate, and Singh, Specialty Legal Advocate for the Real Team, which is our Refugee, Immigrant, and Limited English Speaker Team. If you have questions during the presentation, because you might notice that everybody's on mute, please type them into our chat and our moderator, Kristen, will pass them along during the question and answer period at the end. If you have a private question that you'd rather your name not be attached to asking, please privately chat a message to Kristen. It is now my absolute great pleasure to introduce to you our Director of Education and Outreach, who just celebrated, I will note, her 30th year <laughs> here at Women's Center and Shelter. Rhonda Fleming, take us away. Thank you so much, my CEO. Thank you for this uh, invitation. Thank you to the development department that we are able to uh, kick off uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So with that, I'm ready for the slides to be presented, to be shared. I will fill in the silence while I'm waiting on the slides to come up. I'm going to start with saying that we are talking about identity um, and domestic violence, identity and intimate partner violence. So when we hear the word identity, multiple we can get multiple definitions in our mind for exactly what identity means. So we're definitely thinking today about culture. We're thinking about race. We're thinking about different ways of how identity impress us and what it means. So uh, we do not want to fixate on just one type of identity. And you will see throughout the presentation with all of the presenters that we are talking about race. We're talking about gender identity. We are talking about immigrants and identity within the United States once they have come here. So there will be a lot of different uh, messages coming forward for that. Are we going to have slides on the screen? Rhonda, it appears that we do. I can see them at least. Give a, give a thumbs up if you can see the slides. Uh, thank you, because I do too now. Oh, uh, right. there we go. Excellent. All right. Good to go. Okay. Just, I guess, a moment of vanity. I had the camera faced on me. Sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. All righty. So, um, oh, okay. In true, uh, okay, in true transparency, I'm having technology issues. Am I still on? Rhonda, you are still on. We can see your picture. We can't see you, which is fine if, that, if that's uh, technolo technologically. There we go. We can see you now. Right, I'll take so just a moment to mention that Rhonda just presented to 1,500 people in a flawless webinar what, two weeks ago. So <laughs> our small 45 people here, <laughs> we don't okay. mind with tech problems. No worries at all. All right. So here you go. Just to repeat, now that I have the slide in front of me, the task presented to us as panelists today is to discuss how domestic violence intersects with uh, survivors of uh, different facets. So today we'll be focused on domestic violence within the Black, African, African American. And when I say African, we're not necessarily talking about the continent and different countries. Um, there are a lot of African Americans who identify as African and do not necessarily say African American. So we're using it in the total uh, use of the word. 
and also immigrant refugee victims and LGBTQ victims. Thank you so much. Next slide. So domestic violence. Domestic violence, if you put it in any search engine, you're going to find different parts or different ways that it is defined. So here today, we're looking at uh, domestic, the domestic violence occurs among all races, all ethnic, ethnicity, socioeconomic classes, and it's a pattern of many behaviors. That's so important that we focus in and lock in on that. Uh, uh, as I said, when you put in a search engine, you find a lot of definitions, but you're going to often or usually you're going to find that it's a pattern of behaviors that lead to power and control. I will not necessarily read the slide to you word for word, but so we can have this more as a discussion. However, I want to make sure that we point out that an intimate partner, it is not just physical violence, there's psychological aggression, stalking, coercion, and many other forms. And we're going to talk about more on just on the next slide in just a minute. So there are many types of behaviors that happen that all lead to power and control. A person exercises power and control to maintain power and control over their partner. That's what we're looking at and talking about today. Our next slide says that economic insecurity contributes and combines. So with uh, racism, discrimination, limited education opportunities, and language barriers. You're going to hear more about immigration uh, when Singh presents, um, but it shapes how women of color experience and respond to domestic violence. These challenges also make it very difficult to finding help and support. And we will focus on that a little more in detail as well. So I wanna just add to this as it says economic insecurity. <clears throat> economic insecurity combined with economic abuse is really what can one of the facets that would make it very difficult for women of color, for black African, African-American, to leave a um, relationship. Sometimes when we think about economic insecurity, we don't go to the deep depths of the um, what it really is. That actually means sometimes choosing between a mother eating or a child eating. You know, so when we're thinking of economic insecurity, it's not just that they don't have two cars, one car, and go on vacations. It's talking about can I afford my child's asthma medication if I'm not still in this abusive relationship. So that comment connects for us to why um, someone might stay. And again, with discrimination, with racism, um, it's much more difficult to leave sometimes, especially if leaving means I have to relocate to a different city. How am I going to get a job? How am I going to get established? That all combines when it talks about the combination of racism and discrimination, limited educational opportunities. That's what we're looking at when we consider this. Thank you. So some considerations specific to African-American and women of color and Black women. So culture and or religious beliefs. It's so funny because when I was going through uh, these bullet points, I thought I could just stick on this one for the whole length of my time. So I'm going to be careful not to say too much on this. But culture and religious belief is a whole way of life for a lot of Black and African American women. You have to realize, or one thing to really realize and think about, is that the church was one of and still is one of the first places to uh, promote leadership within the African-American community. So if in my church as an African-American woman, I have status, I have a leadership role, I have a title, I may not want to expose myself as a victim or a survivor of intimate partner violence. Or if I flip that and the abuser is uh, of status in the church. And the church is a way of life. It's not like we just go to Sunday worship and come home. No, we go to choir rehearsal. We help clean up the church. We help with the dinners. You know, we're there for the children's, that uh, support children's ministry and et cetera, et cetera. And it, again, because of the culture that it brings about, because of the belonging that it brings about, it makes it very difficult to just say, I'm going to just leave this relationship. The strong loyalty to race and ethnicity. Um, this is not a personal testimony, but I just want to share what if. What if I was raised in a family where my mom 
and her sisters and my grandma were all sitting around. And here I am at my six, seven, eight year old self sitting around. And you know, you had big ears when you were a kid. So I'm sitting around listening and I hear my uh, aunties and my mom talking and I hear them say things like, oh, you, you should be used to it by now. Or I hear them say things like, well, whatever you do, girl, just do what you can to make it last, you know, your, your, your life is real different with him. So I get these messages at an early age that regardless of what's really going on, it's not that bad because what's more important is that I stay loyal, that I do not do anything to interrupt what my family has come to know as, as the marriage because they only see it from the outside sometimes so that I am um, staying loyal and also loyalty to race. For a long time, that was the belief, and you're going to hear a little more in a, on a couple, in a couple slides about this again, but for a long time, it was that, you know, you're strong. Black women are strong. You can take it, you know, and I think if we break down the word strong and strength, we can find some very positive, positive meanings to saying that I am strong, that I'm resilient. And then there are some challenges to that same belief that impacts being in an intimate partner, violent relationship. So distrust of law enforcement. And thank you, Nicole, for addressing how this is um, much more on the forefront and prevalent in the United States in your opening statement, how addressing that with the uh, murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others that we are paying closer attention uh, to what's really happening. But this systemic racism has been in the United States forever. It's not new. And so because it's not new, this distrust of law enforcement, I could go to many African-American Black families and just at their family reunion and sit down and you're going to hear stories of what has happened within the legal system. I remember even as a child, when the police came through our neighborhood, I was raised in an African-American, predominantly African-American community. And I can remember the cops coming around intimidating us, just staring, sitting in their car and just staring at us. We were not, we were taught how to avoid law enforcement uh, because it's not fair and it still isn't. So there's the distrust. It's, di it's distrust though based on uh, reality. So lack of service providers that look like me, that look like the survivor. If I go into um, a social service program looking for help and I don't see not only any uh, live people, any workers there. I don't see any pictures on the wall. I don't see any brochures. I don't see anything that says, Rhonda, you are welcome here. We're here to help you in your, in your situation. Uh, so then again, I may be very unlikely to seek out and get help. Um, so that is the same for the next uh, bullet point, lack of culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Uh, again, if I'm not welcome there, and you know, um, linguistically. So even if my English, if in the first slide, as I talked about identity, I've talked about limited educational opportunities. So maybe I don't uh, pronounce or I don't say everything the same way that you're used to hearing it. And you correct me when I'm telling you my authentic story about my authentic self and my authentic experience, and you correct me and you tell me that, oh, the way that really should have been said is this, I'm turned off. I'm, I am put down. I don't feel like I belong. So there's a lot of ways that we can pay, pay attention to that to be more inclusive. Thank you. Next slide says, so it um, continued here, uh, lack of trust, um, on history of racism. I think I addressed that in my comments already, but just to reinforce that, you know, if you look at the history of racism and how can you, how can we not at this point in time, but looking at the history of racism and classism in the United States and the U.S. territories, that the unfairness within systems, when we think of redlining, when we think of um, even when uh, getting the vote, and it wasn't until 1964 that Black people could vote in this country. So when we look at the so we're not looking at just hundreds of years ago of history. We're also looking at recent history because that's not that long. That's within my lifetime. So it's not that long ago. Um, the fear that experiences will reflect on or confirm the stereotypes of my ethnicity. So that if I, and this again connects to the statement that I was talking about religious beliefs being a cultural way of life, you know, so if I speak out does it reflect the entire African-American community? If I say something in my, at my job, put a pin in that, not women's center, 
many other uh, employments though. If I speak out in an agency, maybe I am, and I'm picking, choosing any profession, but right now, maybe I'm an attorney and I'm the only, or I'm the first African-American attorney at my firm. If I speak out and talk about uh, being a survivor of intimate partner violence, will they automatically assume, well, yeah, we expected that. We kind of thought that when we hired you because that's the stereotypical thinking that can happen. So I don't want to share my experience, which again, hinders me from getting help. So the same thing of the assumptions of providers are similar to what I was saying above, but the assumptions of providers based on ethnicity. So is it assumed that when I come in to seek help that I don't have a bank account? Is it assumed that I don't have education? Is it assumed that because of my ethnicity that I don't want to do anything different because I see myself as that loyal, strong, resilient Black woman? So therefore, I'm not even offered all of the resources and opportunities that various agencies may have to give me just based on my ethnicity. Again, attitudes and stereotypes about the prevalence of domestic violence and sexual assault in communities of color. You know, so what side of the tracks are you from? What part are you, what neighborhood did you grow up in? What school did you go to? All of that adds up to looking at um, the community as one. So it says the assumption or the assumption and the stereotype is that it's expected that I am a survivor or that I am in this relationship. However, the sad part, the down part of that is it's expected that I also know how to handle it, that I know what to do, you know, uh, because of the stereotypes and prevalence of domestic violence and sexual assault in communities of color. And I just wanted one thing I also want to say about this um, statement here is that a lot of the surveys and statistics that we get are built on people and uh, people who do not have, um, who go to uh, public clinics, you know, who go to public places for help and support. So then those numbers are elevated because that's where we see a lot of the, a lot of the numbers are based on people who sought help in public places and clinics and whatnot. So the, um, the assumption again and the prevalence again is built off of that, off of those numbers often. Thank you for that. Our next slide says, <clears throat> despite their high rates of domestic violence, black survivors are disproportionately, I'm sorry, I have to start to say, disproportionately more likely to be uh, 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 I'm sorry, here we go, uh, more likely to be criminalized in the legal system. You know, so, you know, a story, uh, many years ago here at Women's Center and Shelter, uh, many years ago, I uh, did a program at the Allegheny County Jail and I worked with uh, women in different pods. And I'll never forget this particular story. A uh, woman uh, who identified as a lesbian was in a same-sex relationship and was in a, an abusive relationship with a, she's African-American and her partner was white. She was about six feet. She was about 250 pounds. And she described in, in our group session that we did, she described her partner as petite, thin, white, and blonde. However, she was the abuser. And when the police came to the home, they arrested her just based on looks. And I'll never forget that story because she said it through her tears. She said, it's not me. I'm not the one who should be here, you know, but again, talking about the stereotypes, talking about criminalization of uh, people of color, of African-American and black women in the United States, and then having her share that story, talking, and then she would go on through group to talk about the abuse that she suffered at the hands of her partner. Uh, but myths that black and African, African-American women um, are domineering. You know, that's what I was mentioning earlier. I said we would get back to that more on this slide. That, that requires control or that Black and African, African American women are exceptionally strong under stress and are resilient, uh, increase, uh, increases their vulnerability and discourages from getting help. So if we tie all these points together, religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, loyalty to family, being criminalized in the system and knowing that there is a statement out there that, oh, girl, you're strong, you can take it. Having your friends, your best friends, your cousins, your closest friends telling you things like, you know what, it's a lot better than the other relationship you're in. You can handle this. You can do it. You know, you do hear those statements. So knowing how to free yourself from the myths and combined with coming even sometimes within your own culture, 
re remembering that, that that's not true. It is okay to admit that this is hard. This is difficult. I am a victim survivor and I need help, you know, so seeing us as exceptionally strong. Also, if you go back to the slide where we talked about, not go back, oops not switch back to it, but take our minds back to where we were talking about the history in the United States. You know, so our history, although African history did not start with slavery, let's make that very clear. However, the history of slavery uh, brings about the whole, uh, the whole connotation, the whole message that you are strong. Um, that was a time where you had to survive. You had to be strong to live and to survive. Uh, it does not mean that you do not have moments of, or you do not, that you're not also human and that you need help and that it is okay. I can't say that enough, that it is okay to reach out for help. Our next slide. So um, African-American and Black women do safely leave abusive relationships. I hope these few points have increased your awareness around obstacles, barriers, beliefs, and realities that can lead to differences and difficulties presented when someone says, you should just leave. It's not that easy when we look at the entire picture of everything presented for African, Black, and African-American women in the United States. Thank you so much for your time and your attention, and I will pass this along. I think Rhonda cut out just at the very end, but we are passing it along to Avi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the LGBTQ advocate at Women's Center Shelter, and I'm going to start my presentation with this video. Domestic violence survivors face a major stigma when trying to get out of a dangerous relationship. Survivors from the LGBTQ community face two stigmas. Studies show violence is even more common in that community, yet far fewer victims reach out for help. During Domestic Violence Awareness Month, a brave survivor shares her story with our Courtney Friedman, telling others like her that help and hope are both a reality. It's part of our series confronting domestic violence called Loving in Fear. It started off verbal and then she got abusive. She started grabbing me by the neck and then she started pushing me around and I ended up having to call the police. She took a knife to my suitcase. The stigmas and obstacles piled up and it took Stacy Tumlinson a year to get out of that abusive relationship with her ex-girlfriend. Fear not only of victimization, but also hate from society she's experienced before, even right here in San Antonio. Hey, y'all don't belong here. You know, we don't want your kind here. You know, people that are very judgmental. You know, and that's verbally abusive to us. She says those experiences can sometimes make LGBTQ people feel accustomed to abuse, even in relationships. Research is finally being done on the subject. In 2012, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey found 44% of lesbian women and 61% of bisexual women experienced physical violence, stalking, or rape by intimate partners. 26% of gay men and 37% of bisexual men reported the same experiences. In addition, a 2012 report by the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs found fewer than 5% of LGBTQ survivors sought protective orders from the courts. That being said, Tumlinson says San Antonio's very inclusive in comparison to other places she's lived. And she's proud of the city council, which put extra funding for domestic violence and LGBTQ victims in the 2019 city budget. People are scared to talk about it. The 2019 budget passed with an entire section dedicated to domestic violence, which includes $170,000 for the community-wide communications campaign, addressing the LGBTQ community's need for access to information and resources. God's created all of us, and that's the main thing. We all bleed the same colors. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. We have a long list of... So I wanted to start by sharing that video because um, I just don't think there's a lot of representation out there for, well, honestly, domestic violence in general, but particularly domestic violence in LGBTQ communities. So I wanted to give a little bit of context about what that can look like. Um, <clears throat> a community within LGBTQ that wasn't really touched upon in the video and often in general um, 
was the trans community. And before I talk about some barriers that transgender survivors experience to domestic, uh, accessing domestic violence services, um, I just wanna talk about like what it means to be transgender and, and how diverse that community is because I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not just people who are physically transitioning um, surgically from you know, male to female or, um, or you know, whatever that may be. Um, transgender really just means anyone who doesn't identify with the um, sex they were assigned at birth. So for example, if you were born um, a woman, if you were born with female parts and you decided you identified as more, not really with any gender, not really male or female, you're kind of just a little bit of everything um, that could be considered under the trans umbrella. So I wanted to be really clear about what it means when I'm talking about transgender people and transgender survivors, um, which are of course people that we serve at Women's Center and Shelter. Um, so when we look at working with transgender survivors and really any survivors who experience stigmatization um, within greater society, we're looking at multiple systems that are being used against uh, folks within the community. So not only do you have an intimate partner that might be um, abusive in some way to the individual. We're also looking at ways that society is abusive to the individual and that potentially families have been abusive or um, not been supportive. Um, maybe someone grew up with a, a parent that didn't use the correct pronouns when referring to them. And if you think about it in your own context, I mean, how annoying would that be if you've always been called she your whole life and then somebody just kept calling you him um, over and over again. That would probably be very irritating for you. Um, so think about how that feels for people who, you know, identify differently than what others are, are calling them. Um, that, that's considered a, um, a microaggression and over time that can be very exhausting for people. So all of those types of ways that people experience um, discrimination in the greater community, those things also manifest within domestic violence systems often. Um, so the, the three main, I was, when I was looking at some different studies, the three main um, systems that were outlined were uh, people who deal with domestic violence have to interact with police officers, they interact with victim advocates and often medical providers as well, depending on the nature of the abuse um, that they were experiencing. So similar to what Rhonda was saying about um, the Black and African American community, there is a lot of mistrust um, in the LGBTQ community with um, law enforcement. As you can see, according to a study, 66% of trans women have been harassed by the police. So. Um, you know, if somebody who is trans is in a domestic violence relationship, they may not want to reach out to the police because that might not feel like a safe option to them. 21% have been physically assaulted by police and 24% have been sexually assaulted. And again, this isn't to say that ev everyone in law enforcement, um, you know, has done this, but it's just, it's an issue and it's something that um, needs to be examined more, I think. When we're looking at victim advocates, um, there, there are a lot of barriers to trans folks obtaining treatment. Sometimes there are um, very invasive screening processes that trans individuals have to go through to be accepted into a women's shelter, for example. So if you have someone who's a trans woman who was assigned male at birth, they might um, have someone at a women's shelter ask them to show them, you know, their genitals to prove that they're, they, they've done the, the full transition. But in reality, you know, a, a full transition is not marked by, by what's happening physically. It's marked by how the person identifies and how they express themselves. Um, so 6% of trans people have received unequal treatment 
and domestic violence programs. I honestly think it's higher than that. But another thing that really signifies that a group is uh, experiencing a lot of discrimination is uh, you can't find a lot of studies about that population. So there's definitely, there's a shortage of studies about LGBTQ survivors, and there's even more of a shortage about, of studies about trans survivors. 4% um, verbally harassed, 1% physically assaulted. So, and also, you know, it, it is harder for people when you hear a shelter is for women. If they, if you don't identify as a woman, maybe you identify as non-binary or you're not sure, um, excuse me, that can be a little bit, you know, that can turn people away. And also, you know, as Rhonda was saying, if there isn't adequate representation in the pamphlets that are being passed out in the shelter itself, in the offices, um, that can cause people to not feel welcome. So that's also very important. Um, another factor is that 24% of trans women have been denied equal treatment by doctors. And this is re this relates to what I was just saying about there not being enough research out there about trans survivors and trans folks in general. Um, many research studies conflate t uh, LGBTQ identity, or sorry, GLBQ identity with trans. So they'll kind of just do a study about all LGBTQ people. And maybe you have 50 people in the study, but only two of them identify as trans. So that's not really giving you a lot of information about that community. Um, and, and they are different communities. There's different issues sometimes that trans survivors face in comparison to uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual survivors. Next slide. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, barriers in domestic violence systems specific to lesbian, gay, and bisexual survivors. So as you heard in the video, uh, bisexual survivors actually experience um, sexual violence and stalking at a higher rate than um, other, other survivors. So um, that's just something to keep in mind that even within the LGBTQ community, um, you know, bisexual folks and trans folks tend to be the most stigmatized even within that group. There's a lot of biphobia um, that goes on. Even, you know, sometimes, um, you know, somebody who identifies as a lesbian not um, being accepting of someone who's bi and, and, you know, saying they're not, they're not gay enough or they're, you know, pretending to be gay or something like that. So, um, I just wanted to put that out there that there are definitely systems of oppression within the LGBT community as well. So one thing that really stands out to me when working in domestic violence systems is that it's really important for domestic violence systems to stay up to date on their um, SOGI trainings or uh, LGBTQ gender identity trainings. Because, um, you know, you might have a training from two years ago that you offered for staff and already the language is not um, current anymore because language in general is ever evolving. But in the LGBTQ community, it's just changing constantly. So um, I think it's really important to stay up to date on that. Um, for example, like a word like transgendered, like to say someone is transgendered, like 10 years ago, like that was probably okay to say, but now we say that someone identifies as transgender. So that's an example. So again, looking at um, similar bear, uh, systems as before. So when LGB survivors come into contact with police officers, 40% um, of gay and bisexual male survivors believed the police would be unhelpful with a, a domestic violence situation. Um, there is a myth with both lesbian or lesbian, gay and bisexual survivors that um, within LGB partnerships, the battering is mutual. So, um, you know, two gay men, there can't be an abuser in that situation because they're equally strong or something like that, or they're just guys roughhousing. Um, same thing with lesbians and bisexual women. And if it's between two women, or a woman and someone who's non-binary, you know, oh, well, they're just having a cat fight or something. When in reality, you're still seeing um, that power and control 
being enacted in a relationship and it can be you know just as severe and damaging as it would be in a heterosexual relationship so um that that view can be very harmful within any of these domestic violence systems um additionally 48 percent of LGBTQ violence survivors report experiencing police misconduct, including unjustified arrests, excessive force and entrapment. So again, folks are a lot less likely to report that they are experiencing domestic violence because um, you know, they might experience additional violence from law enforcement. So that's definitely another barrier to services. Um, as I was kind of touching on before, often domestic violence services are not tailored to fit an LGBTQ lens. So, you know, you might be, you might go into a group, a support group, and, and somebody immediately assumes that a, a female's partner is male um, or saying, you know, what did he do to you? Or just using gendered language without really knowing the background of the survivor. Um, so that's really important to be aware of. And additionally, negative outcomes and intimate partner violence are more common for sexual minority victims. And 50% of bisexual women have experienced negative outcomes and 33% of lesbian women. So again, you know, you're seeing even within LGB systems that there are individuals who experience an even higher amount of discrimination than others. You also have to worry about um, other survivors within shelter systems and support groups at times uh, showing prejudice toward LGB identified individuals. And similar to what I was saying about trans survivors, there can be a lack of sexuality affirming care. Um, you know, it, people just wanna feel seen and it's really important to let the individual be the, the expert on their gender, the expert on their sexuality. If you don't know, what their pronouns are, what the language is to use, it's, it's always okay to ask, um, but you know, make sure to do your homework too. So this next slide I have is the power and control wheel. Um, this one's a little bit different than the standard one because it focuses in on LGBTQ um, domestic violence and what that can look like. So as you see, on the outside, we have um, the, the bigger systemic issues that can lead to oppression and, and can be used in abusive relationships as well. And then in the smaller circle, there's, of course, the physical violence that can happen. And then in the middle, you have all the other kinds of abuse that can happen, which often fall under the radar because, you know, some people, if they don't see bruises, they think that, you know, it's okay. But emotional abuse can be just as damaging. Um, so I'm just going to focus in on a couple of these here and focus in on the ones that are really related to um, being a member of the LGBTQ community. So one of the ones I'm looking at here is in the using intimidation section. So using looks, actions, gestures to reinforce homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic control. Um, again, this could really apply to any stigmatized or marginalized group. So using something like, um, oh, you know, nobody's going to believe you that I'm, uh, that someone's abusing you because, you know, you're, you're gay or you're trans, um, using someone's identity to oppress them. Um, another one. So in using isolation, there's one that says saying no. Oh, that's what I just said. <laughs> saying no one will believe you, especially not if you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. So yeah, just using that identity to oppress someone. Um, using, okay, so here's another one. Threatening to tell your ex-spouse or authorities that you are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. Um, and th threatening that like, you know, the, someone's children might be taken away because of that. Um, because as I said before, there are systems that will possibly not listen to someone or can be, um, you know, harassing somebody in this community, it can be extra isolating being in that situation because, you know, you really may believe that no one will believe you or no one, um, you know, will take you seriously or maybe that they'll 
uh, think that, you know, one person was the abuser or maybe both people will get arrested. So it's just, there's just a lot of additional barriers here. Um, denying, minimizing, and blaming, saying it's just fighting, not abuse. Kind of touched on that earlier. Um, yeah, just a lot of it's really like, looks like some of the same um, methods of abuse that you see in heterosexual relationships. There's just that additional, those additional ways that the system can be used to oppress someone. Um, and something else I wanted to touch upon that's not on here is uh, sometimes with trans survivors, abuse can look like interactional control. So an abuser can manipulate work that the victim has done on their identity and actually hold them back from how they express their gender identity. So, you know, somebody might experience more um, just struggle and, and not be able to express who they truly are and it can delay um, their transition and self-actualization process. Um, one other thing I wanted to throw out there before I pass this on, um, I forgot to put in a slide for this, but I did want to let everyone know that um, I am offering groups for LGBTQ survivors over Zoom. Um, so my group for youth is second Mondays at 3.30 p.m. and my over 25 group is third Mondays at 3.30. If you're interested in either of those or you have any questions, um, I'll throw my email in the chat, but it is avd at wcspittsburgh.org. Thank you for listening. And with that, I'm going to pass this along to Sing with the Real Team. Thank you, Avi. Um, Refugees and immigrants and limited English speakers are from various social and economic and cultural and religious backgrounds. We need to have an in-depth understanding of the domestic violence that happened within their communities, within their culture, so that we can respond respectfully and effectively to their specific needs and um, to um, the, and their um, challenge as well. So as Rhonda mentioned earlier, some of the considerations uh, like cultural and uh, religious beliefs that restrain the survivor from leaving the abusive relationship, strong loyalty binds to race, culture, and family, lack of service providers that look like um, the survivor or share common experiences also apply to refugee, immigrant, and limited English speaking survivors as well. So today I will briefly talk about the challenge that refugee, immigrant, and limited English um, survivor um, facing in an abusive relationship from three perspectives, language, culture, and legal. Before we go into talk about language challenge, I would like to share a short video with you. And please um, feel free to type in the chat. Let us know what do you think and how do you feel? Excuse me, sir. I'm so sorry. She's been crying nonstop. She has a temperature of 105. I don't know what to do. I'm bipolar. Please, just every time I see her, she throws up. Bipolar. What are you saying? She's crying. 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 What? She's burning up. Feel her head. Tranquilly, 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 can I check? Um, the Monday is Aska. What is he doing? What do you have? My my baby, uh, she's got a temperature of 105. She every time I feed her, she throws up. Please, uh, can you? Let's get a more temporary. She's burning up. Feel her head. More rapidly. Uh, please, just just please just feel her head. Feel her head. Just someone let me in. Don't let anyone understand what I'm saying. Please, someone help me. 
20% of U.S. citizens speak limited English. For these 25 million Americans, professional interpreters can mean the difference between life and death. Thank you. So many of our refugee immigrant uh, clients speak limited English and they need help to reach out and get connected with community resources. And they might not don't feel comfortable to, uh, speaking English and reaching out for help. And also a person who can communicate in English does not mean that he or she has the necessary language skills to understand the legal terminology. Offering interpreter services to limited English clients um, are required for organizations and agencies that receive a federal funding. But reality is the information needed from the limited English speaker might gathered from a English speaking abuser, a uh, extended family member, or their children who speak English. Um, that may lead to the distortion in the information. I've seen police officers refuse to use um, professional interpreters. I've seen attorneys using family members to communicate uh, with the case related, case related information. I've seen organizations or agencies do not offer translation or interpretation service to their uh, limited English speaker clients. In Allegheny County, if it's a court hearing, it is always recommended to um, request a court interpreter for the court hearing. And for more information, please visit the Allegheny County Court Language Access Interpreter Request website to fill out a form and uh, request a court interpreter for your client. Their office is doing an amazing job to try their best to um, feel, fulfill your client's needs. Um, so referring back to the video that we played, um, and I've seen um, some, um, you know, in the chats, it is frightened and frustrated. And I don't know how, like, I, every time I watch it, I always have tears in my eyes because I really feel that. And I believe that you feel that too. So once um, there was one time I attend a community event, um, which they speak Spanish and they offered uh, an interpreter who uh, interpret everything from Spanish to English. That was a very interesting experience for me because I sat through the whole events waiting for the interpreter to Convey the message to me, and then during the break, I was uh, get you know getting connections with uh, other professionals, uh, other leaders and members of the community, um, and I was standing um, like at a position where I cannot see the presenter and the audience, um, and then. At one point, I realized something's different and I turned around and I saw the presenter already started the second session and I was talking loud. I would never do that if I understand the language. I felt embarrassed, um, but imagine a non-English speaking or limited English speaking client and survivor going through the abuses and the trauma and seeing the um, authority um, figures right in front of them. The police were called and they were not able to understand English or communicate for what's going on. What will that impact their behavior? Um, and I will talk about culture, please. Thank you. Um, so those clients, they may come from countries or places um, where they had a few or no rights, especially if they are women or children. 
many types of abuses are not defined as a crime in their culture. And the communities and extended family members play a major role uh, in domestic violence. Maintaining uh, family harmony through cooperation and self-sacrifice within traditional roles are the foundations of many immigrant families. And their community might respond to victims' effort of reaching out for help by shunning them or putting pressure on them to remain in the marriage. Communities and extended family members might contribute to the domestic violence by pressing the survivor to stay with their abusive partners or advise them not to report domestic violence to the police and they regard domestic violence as a private matter and should be kept within the families. They might blame survivors for causing abuse or jeopardizing the abuser's immigration status. And then leaving the abusive uh, relationship for a safer environment might mean losing not only the financial support, their own possessions, but also means that they will lose the only support that they can get from the community and the extended family. And that means for many of them, professionals, advocates like us are probably the only one telling us that, uh, telling them that domestic violence is a crime. And life can be different. Relationship can be abuse free and love shouldn't hurt. Um, and also they may be focused on on needs that seem relatively unimportant to you, but really make sense in their own culture and realities. They may resist help or assistance from our mental health services. Many of them may suffer various uh, mental health issues, uh, including post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, but they believe there's a stigma stick to them uh, if they, they reach out to the uh, mental health service for help. A tip for this section would be um, pay more attention to verbal and nonverbal cues um, when you are working with your uh, clients that are refugee immigrants and limited English speaking survivors and uh, gather information about uh, the survivor's interpretation of the culture and uh, start from there. Next slide, thank you. Uh, for the barriers in legal system. So abusers often use immigration related threats to assert power and control over their intimate partner. Um, fear that talking to a professional or report abuse um, will get them or their family member um, deported. So fear of deportation is a very huge and powerful tool that abusers use to control and manipulate uh, victims and to keep them to stay in an abusive relationship. Immigration status influences survivors' response to domestic violence. Survivors often consider their um, um, immigration status as well as that of um, their partners. They are um, afraid that many, like studies show that many um, immigrant survivors, um, they do not report domestic violence out of the fear that the, their partner will um, go to jail or get deported, or um, they and their children might get deported along with their partners. Um, and I'm familiar with the legal system and the resources available to them in this country. Um, a lot of our uh, refugee immigrants and the limited English speaking clients, they don't have 
they don't know much about the legal system here in the United States, which makes sense. Um, the legal system might be so different from the one they where they come from. And um, they are afraid of misstepping. So for a lot of them, they might don't, they might not taking any steps at all all for a really long time until they cannot take it anymore. So abusers um, really use that as a tool to control them and abusers might lie to them about uh, the knowledge about the legal system. I have a, a client told me that the abusers told them that if they go file PFA, protection from abuse order against the abuser, that will cause them to go to jail and they will get deported and they will lose jobs. And of course that, and they blaming the victim, it's all their fault, which is not true. Not true from so many different ways. So, and I also have clients uh, who are really young, like international students, they are from campus, they are still in universities. Um, they are so afraid to talk, to reach out for help. They are afraid to talk to professionals about the domestic violence situation. Um, they are afraid that if they started to reach out, that will get the other party uh, expelled from the school or program they were enrolled in. So that's something that our legal advocacy department and the real team uh, which serves uh, refugee immigrants and limited English speaking clients. We try to reach out to Title IX office as well as Office of International Services in the hope that uh, to reach out to more international students, uh, exchange scholars and international staffs as well as their family members uh, that, you know, to learn more about domestic violence and the legal rights, their victim rights and options. So with that, um, I will end my presentation today by getting out, by getting the word out. Um, we are here. Um, so to our communities and those uh, groups who need help, um, WCS and the real team who serves a refugee, immigrant, and limited English speaking clients, we are here. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And can we please offer a huge Zoom round of applause to Rhonda, Avi, and Singh for their fantastic presentation. So just a Zoom applause. Woo! Thank you all so, so much. Um, we know it's right up against one o'clock. So if you do have to jump, we appreciate that. We just appreciate you being here. Um, we are going to spend a couple more minutes uh, and the rest of the time today um, answering any questions. We actually don't have any in the chat yet, but we do still want questions. And in the meantime, I want to remind you of the schedule for our three other sessions, Domestic Violence and Families, which is October 15th, Domestic Violence and Money, which is October 22nd, Domestic Violence and Men, which is October 29th. And the week that we skip, which is October 8th from noon to one, is of course the Stand Up for Standing Firm virtual luncheon that's featuring an amazing keynote speaker, Rachel Louise Snyder, who's author of No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Could Kill Us. So you can register for any of these online at wcspittsburgh.org backslash dvam2020. Uh, if somebody can please put that in the chat, that would be awesome. Um, the Standing Firm event is the only one with a cost, which is a very much discounted cost from our typical in-person cost. Um, so we did want to point that out, but hopefully you're getting a sense of really how intensely complex uh, domestic violence is um, based on a multitude of different factors. Um, so if we can talk for uh, just a minute uh, about different ways to help and because uh, we know that there are always questions about that. So if we can jump to those slides for a second, please. Um, ways to reach out if you or a loved one are feeling unsafe, we're available to help 24-7. Um, services, of course, are all free and confidential. You can see our, our phone number up there, our new text and chat as well. Please utilize those. 
um, if needed. And then of course our Are You Safe app, um, areyousafe.net. And um, if you are interested in any ways to help with domestic violence and help specifically with women's center and shelter and just show your support, five very easy ways to show your support to during, during Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is this month. Um, we of course are always uh, welcoming donations at wcscanhelp.org. Um, we would encourage you to donate a meal or items from our wish list, which is always kept up to date. Um, we encourage you to wear purple on October 22nd. I feel like I have enough purple to get me through the whole month, but definitely we'll be wearing it on October 22nd. And then you can compete in our trivia or treat virtual trivia night. So this is the first time we're doing this. It promises to be lots of fun. And uh, you, of course, can get educated, uh, which you're doing right now today, and share our posts. And we encourage everybody to strive for five for Domestic Violence Awareness Month 2020. So now we will pass it over to our amazing Chief Development Officer, Ms. Kristen Brown, to uh, moderate our Q&A. Kristen. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I think at this point we didn't get any questions in the chat. So if there's anybody who does um, want to come off mute, I think you certainly can at this point. We have some um, prepared questions. So I'll just give it a quick 10 seconds if anyone wants to bravely come off of mute and ask a question or I can go to my um, prepared question. So does anyone want to come off of mute? Okay, I think that's our 10 seconds. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to, uh, some of the presenters, um, first, thank you to the presenters. Um, some of the presenters uh, touched upon it, but sort of outside of what you covered, um, what is Women's Center and Shelter doing or what are, you know, some of the things that we're doing to address some of the disparities in the group? So Avi, you talked about um, your work in support groups, but um, maybe just like one thing um, that the organization is doing um, to sort of address some of the disparities. Sure. So, I mean, I, in addition to the support groups that I offer outside of the, um, sorry, if you hear any background noise, um, that I offer, um, outside of the shelter, I also do, um, meet with survivors within the shelter, um, to make sure that their needs are being met and, um, provide, crisis intervention and, and just make sure that, um, you know, folks are feeling like they're being seen and they're being heard. And, and if they are experiencing any issues, um, you know, related to their identity that um, we're addressing that as an agency. So that's another um, service that I'm currently offering. Thanks, Bobby. And then Rhonda and Singh, do you want to add to any of that or? Certainly, I'll add to that because I, I would like to add that in addition to what has been said already, some of the services we also offer is uh, we have a medical advocacy program where we have a medical advocate. Pre-COVID, she would go actually into hospitals and medical settings. Right now, she is still offering her services telephonically, so you can reach out for our medical advocacy services. We are also connected with our local uh, child Welfare, CYF, Children, Youth, and Families. So we have uh, specialists and advocates on site who can help um, moms who are going through a lot of times with intimate partner violence. There have been false reports and there have been real reports. So either way, we have certainly have advocates to support moms with that. We also have a battering, battering intervention program. And so we have uh, men in our program, and this for our uh, battery intervention program, it's all men. Another program in, in Allegheny County offers it for women. Uh, however, men who come to the battery intervention program are assigned to complete 24 weeks of learning about their thought patterns, their feelings, and recognizing how that connects to their belief system and allowing them to use abuse, manipulation, and control. So I uh, think Women's Center Shelter is always at the cutting edge of doing something to address uh, outline groups for uh, intimate partner violence. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. And also, I would like to add that um, the WCS real team, which serves refugee immigrants and limited English speaking clients, are making efforts to reach out to different communities. Um, we have, um, as Nicole mentioned earlier, WCS has the text 
function, text function, um, and that uh, has a function where um, we can translate different into different languages and to communicate with uh, limited English speakers. And, and also we have uh, all the outreach materials um, translated into different languages. Uh, we have outreach team to reach out to communities with those brochures that are written in their language and so that they know about our services and we are still here, we are here for them. And also we have the interpreter training. Uh, we just had the very first session of this year um, yesterday, the Women's Center Shelter uh, Domestic Violence Interpreter Training. Um, we are hoping that, um, you know, to offer those sessions to the interpreters who are working with our uh, the, the survivors um, can understand the trauma that our victims are going through and those cultural barriers, language barriers and legal barriers um, in, a, in a hope that they can um, assist our survivors uh, in a more professional and skilled way. And also um, from our legal advocacy department, we are helping our um, refugee immigrant limited English speaking clients filing um, pro protection from abuse orders. And if we identify if the client need an interpreter, we will put more, you know, we will um, um, communicate with our colleagues, among our colleagues, we will reach out to the uh, Allegheny County Court Administrative Office to order interpreters and our attorneys and our legal advocates will try to prepare the petition in advance to help them uh, so that they don't need to wait for the whole like couple hours um, in order like in the court in order to get that petition filled out. Um, so that's just some parts of our efforts that we are doing and we will continue doing our um, best of our um, effort to reach out and help our clients. Thank you, Sing. Um, and I think uh, we'll wrap up here, but, but one of the messages is that we're here. And so the outreach materials that Sing talked about, um, we have plenty of postcards, um, flyers uh, in multiple languages. So um, we have an email address, it's outreach at wcspittsburgh.org. Um, if anyone would like those materials, anyone is welcome um, to distribute those. So we have plenty of materials. Um, we just really want people to know, especially now, that we're here and our services are available. So um, we thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you um, at the Standing Firm virtual luncheon next week, at, next week on October 8th, and then um, at our other sessions throughout October. So... Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, all awesome the team. Thank Yay. you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.